law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hello, and welcome to episode 113 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, March 22nd. I'm your host, Pete Strzok. Hey, Pete. I'm Allison Gill. Uh, we have a lot today. We have reports that uh, a Trump indictment from the Manhattan District Attorney is expected either late Monday or Wednesday, according to Politico. We, just so everyone knows, we record this show on Monday afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. And there's no telling when it's going to show up. I know I saw on Twitter that uh, NYPD was putting barricades in place around the New York courthouse today, early, like late this morning. So I do think something's imminent. Uh, now, but beyond that, you're right. We have a ton to talk about. We'll also cover the indictment of Guo Wengi, a 400-page filing in Georgia by Trump's lawyers trying to quash any indictments there by trying to both discredit the special purpose grand jury and finally potentially money laundering through the parent company of Trump's Truth Social being investigated in the Southern District of New York. The story was reported by Hugo Lowell and The Guardian, and we'll be speaking with him about the details of those payments. Yeah, and so I'm looking forward to talking to Hugo about that. But first, uh, let's take a moment to thank our new and returning patrons. You make this show possible for a little, as little as a buck an episode. You can sign up at patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod that's a-i-s-l-e 45 p-o-d so thanks to dolores deborah katz andrea kelly karen george virginia real cassandra's cats just the cats fountain pen teacher awesome bill gaskins steve burdick ottawa steph elizabeth mclean cindy mcnary jessica freeman west lisa christie sylvia tugnetti angie smith jim dog ian little Tiffany Trump was adopted, AG's <laughs> evil twin, yes, I have one, and Robert Broughton. So thank you very much to our patrons. We appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all very much. So let's get on into all this. So first up, imminent charges, it looks like, coming out of Manhattan. Politico reported on Monday morning that an indictment is expected either late today, Monday, or early Wednesday. Law enforcement officials are meeting on Monday to plan for the possible indictment. Uh, in addition, within the grand jury, an attorney named uh, Costello is testifying to the grand jury that Cohen wants revenge and is embellishing his testimony. In hmm. response, Cohen is standing by. Can I, yeah, I don't, I mean, I think, you know, there, it, what's interesting is of all the people that, you know, Trump could have sent into the grand jury as a rebuttal witness, he didn't choose Don Jr., you know, who signed the the payment, uh, one of the checks uh, to Cohen paying him back, I think, for this, the hush money payment, but you know, they put this uh, Costello guy in there. I don't know what you know about him, but. Uh, it, well, it's, he it's... was mentioned uh, in the uh, Mueller report a little bit when uh, we were talking about obstruction of justice because he dangled a pardon to Michael Cohen. And, you know, when they were talking about the whole uh, hush money payment that the Southern District of New York eventually decided not to go after Trump for. And they actually I think Bill Barr was trying to remove any mention of individual one in that indictment. And the Southern District was like, we are, we are going to charge him, but come on, man. So <laughs> that stuff uh, stayed in in the in the filing there. But I think what's interesting here, and Jennifer Rubin brought this up too, she said, you know, this might not be uh, just him coming in to try to discredit Cohen. It could also be that he could be facing a charge for that witness tampering. Uh, but, you know, it seems like the reporting so far uh, is limited to the fact that he is simply there to discredit Cohen. And, you know, Politico says if they wrap up that testimony today and vote on a true bill or no bill, we'll know by late this evening, Monday, as we record this, 
whether there be an indictment today. Otherwise, that indictment would likely come on Wednesday unless they decide to bring in somebody else uh, based on Costello's testimony. We don't want to like cut that possibility off either. Yeah, I can't imagine that it's going to be that compelling. I mean, Costello's got a lot of problems, and I think that's part of the main reason they have Cohen there on standby as a rebuttal witness is to sit there and say, okay, well, you heard from Cohen, and have the prosecutors then walk through with Cohen all this information about Costello, his role in all of these events, and sort of in the eyes of the grand jury, sit there and say, look, as much as uh, Costello might have tried to give you concerns about me, <laughs> let me tell you the truth about Costello and his role in all of this. So I think, you know, again, I, I do think they had planned and still plan on trying to get a true bill out this afternoon. I think my guess is the entire reason Trump went on his little truth social rampage about I'm getting arrested on Tuesday is that somebody in the district attorney's office, either informally or through a leak, reached out to somebody in Trump's camp and said, hey, we might have an indictment as early as Wednesday or as early as Monday night in which Trump in his mind said, okay, well, if that's Monday night, I'm going to get arrested on Tuesday. So I think that's how, if I had to guess, Trump sort of his mind coalesced around this Tuesday date. So again, you Either know, we that, don't know. Or he was just watching Fox News who said he was going to be arrested uh, <laughs> this week. Yeah, it, and, and you know, because they're, you know, Rupert Murdoch is turning on Trump and going full DeSantis now. Uh, who who also brought up, interestingly enough, today this case saying, well, I don't know anything about having to pay people off for porn star stuff. And like, I thought it was interesting that he brought that up. But, you know, also Trump's lawyers, when when asked about the Tuesday thing, said we don't know anything about that. So I, I think it might have just been put together in his head that way from the reporting that we got from, as you mentioned, law enforcement agencies meeting today. To, to put up barricades and discuss how they're going to protect people, uh, you know, from from possible Trump supporters showing up. Uh, but I think one of the scariest rants from Trump for me was when he actually called on the NYPD to abandon their posts, basically, and and not protect the DA's office or the people of New York. And to if he has protesters there to, quote unquote, take back the nation to to just sort of either not stand in their way or maybe even help them out. I thought that that was like he 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 says a lot of desperate ridiculous things on true social, but that one was particularly scary telling the NYPD to to violate their oaths and just stand, you know, stand back basically. Yeah, and it's not like he has a, you know, no history of knowing what happens when he calls on his supporters to do something. I mean, so, you know, A, whatever he may or may not try and claim he did or didn't know prior to January 6th, it's abundantly clear to him and the rest of the nation when he says things like this, how his some of his supporters interpret that and what they're willing to do. And so the fact that he's calling on them to protest, 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 nowhere in there is he saying do it peacefully, nowhere is he saying respect law enforcement. He is clearly, in my opinion, calling for for, you know, violence. And it's not just Trump. I saw, you know, Bernie Carrick on Twitter was doing the same thing. I think, uh, you know, sometime over this weekend, if I remember correctly, he was essentially calling on the same thing, saying uh, local, state, and federal law enforcement, you know, if you're faced with illegal, you know, calls for illegal behavior, it's your duty not to, you know, not to engage in this sort of activity. So he's got, you know, Bernie Carrick, rem remember, the felon, convicted felon, pardoned after spending, I think, you know, several years in jail, if I remember correctly, that, you know, who was the former commissioner of the NYPD and still runs with Trump in his circles. But it's not that that is a recurring theme. And it's coming from people who, you know, had, you know, not just Trump, but senior former members of the NYPD. So it, it's tremendously concerning to me as well. I think that's, you know, I don't know, I don't think New York in general, but certainly NYPD is going to have a lot of tolerance for a bunch of knuckleheads trying to descend on Manhattan and try and shut the city down. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, the logical place would be to protest around the courthouse, which is in, you know, the southern part of Manhattan. So, but hmm. it doesn't take much to disrupt traffic in uh in Manhattan. So we'll, we'll see what happens. And by the time, you know, by the time you all are listening to us right now, it's, you know, quite likely we will have an indictment. So, you know, whatever comes out, stay tuned. And certainly the bonus update for patrons, we'll be talking all about whatever happens with the indictment, as well as any sort of response before, during, or after that indictment. Yeah. And um, right now it's about 3.30 over in New York and Cohen was still tweeting. So if he's standing by for a rebuttal, I don't think he's gone in. Uh, yet, unless he's already gone in, but you know, we'll we'll see what happens there. 
Um, and it, to me, it does seem like a bad move to send in Costello. Uh, he can be asked anything. He would have to plead the fifth if he didn't want to incriminate himself. He's dangled pardons. He could be part of witness tampering uh, if there's charges there. But, you know, we will uh, we'll find out uh, regardless, like you said. And uh, uh, and like uh, the other thing, too, if between if maybe somehow Monday night we get an indictment, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll try to break into this podcast with a special announcement and it'll go right here. OK, so if you didn't hear anything, <laughs> if this had been an actual indictment, that yes. would have been followed by news of an actual indictment. So anyway, thank you, uh, Pete, for that story. And um, we'll see what happens. It's, it's, it's imminent. And it looks like this week. Next up, though, Trump's lawyers. And by the way, go to Glenn Kirshner's Twitter. You can see a picture of one of these lawyers. It's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. He's wearing like a pinstripe suit and a giant dookie rope on his wrist. It's really uh, if, like if you could stereotype a Trump lawyer this is you would Google it and this guy's picture would come up. But they have filed a 483 page motion. Now, a lot of that's exhibits. So I don't want you to think that they wrote 483 pages. But this motion is for three things. First, to quash the Fulton County Special Purpose Grand Jury Report, to preclude the use of any evidence derived therefrom, which is weird because that's something it seems like a motion in limine you would file after charges come. But he wants to preclude that and to recuse the DA's office based on uh, her, uh, you know, partying with or throwing a, a gala for for one of the. And, and I mean, the, the judge already McBurney already recused her for looking into that guy in this particular case. We'll talk about that in a second. So uh, a lot of these arguments are the same exact arguments that multiple witnesses made when they were trying to quash their subpoenas. You know, we reported all of that on this show in the past including that the special purpose grand jury is civil and not criminal, and therefore no testimony counts. And all those battles were lost for the exact same reasons, and this one will likely lose too. Um, and so, yeah, the argument here, Pete, is that the special grand jury itself should not have been treated as a criminal proceeding. But there's a there's a rebuttal to that, right? Yeah, there is. And I mean, so look, it's the the all of these, and it's not just in Georgia. I mean, New York, South Carolina, Florida, all reject claims that special grand jury proceedings were civil, and therefore that you know, in the case of the out of state witnesses, that they couldn't uh, be compelled to appear. Um, but it's it's I think, you know, it, it it is an attempt in my mind. All of this, and I've read some really interesting legal analysis saying what you know, this filing is not trivial in in the sense that it isn't just kind of nonsense, vexatious litigation, that there is an actual basis, however far-fetched, to make these arguments. And it's not designed so much with an expectation that any of these charges are going to stick, but it's designed because there is a very real possibility that there is a chance for either an interlocutory appeal or some sort of appeal after the fact that will serve to cause it to move up the chain in terms of the sort of Georgia state system, and that all of this is an effort to create legit, legitimate, I mean, you know, sort of judicially appropriate in this terms of it's not frivolous litigation, but all designed to slow things down. That if they make enough mm -hmm. of these arguments, that even the sort of course of saying, okay, well, let's hear briefings from both sides. Let's move it up a level in terms of appealing. Let's hear briefings at that level. Let's kick it back down for, you know, for further action. If you're able to add a year or more to these proceedings, that's all they're trying to do. And that this isn't so much a, there's no expectation that this is going to prevent Georgia from charging and prosecuting Trump. It's absolutely designed to slow that down, to add a year more to the process. Yeah. Although I, I do think that you won't be able to stay any of this because as I said, most of these, I guess, complaints here, the th you know, the complaints that they have here are things that you would complain about after an indictment is returned. Um, now, you know, trying to quash, I guess, questioning the <laughs> the entirety of how Georgia sets up its grand juries um, is maybe something that might go up and down through the courts. Uh, but again, that's already been decided several times. Uh, but th that doesn't preclude it from being decided again, um, which is, you know, I think with the point that you're bringing up. Uh, another thing that uh, they're arguing here in this filing is that comments made by special grand jurors to the media, we're thinking Emily Coors and perhaps those five special grand jurors that were interviewed for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, 
uh, as well as by the presiding judge in the case, Robert McBurney, tainted any future criminal proceedings. So now they're saying the whole thing is tainted. It's fruit of the poisonous tree. The evidence that came out through the grand jury, it's all tainted. And uh, what um, what do we know about what Judge McBurney has said about that? Well, he said, you know, very clearly that, and it was uh, designed, I think, you know, in part specifically for the uh, forewoman's sort of comments that, look, jurors are free to discuss their experience and the details as long as they don't talk about deliberations. And he was very specific about saying deliberations are those discussions that were had amongst the grand jury when they only they were present. So if prosecutors were there, if witnesses are there, that's not deliberation. So other than that, they're free to discuss all of it. And he was very clear on that, cited the Georgia law. So it is, again, in my mind, absolutely clear that at the end of the day, this isn't going to have a uh, legal merit that's going to be sustained, but it does, you know, and again, I think the other thing in my mind is not only does it slow things down, but this is, this is red meat for Trump and all his supporters to sit there and say, see, this is all a biased proceeding. This goes in fundraising emails. This goes on his little rants on Truth Social. This is the sort of thing that, you know, beyond, I think, good defense lawyer lawyering, it also provides, you know, it, it feeds the beast of the sort of you know, diatribes that seem to consume Trump's existence uh, on the one hand, feeding his sort of sense of victimization and the other hand, providing grist for the fundraising mill. So, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the final thing, I think that the, the third point, and you mentioned it, that, you know, Willis should have been disqualified from the investigation months ago after McBurney disqualified her from what you described that one pursuing the evidence about that one particular state official. But, you know, as you noted, uh, McBurney talked about that, right? Yeah, and, and from the Politico article here, it says McBurney swept aside challenges to Willis's ability to lead the probe, the whole probe, after evidence showed she promoted the candidacy of a lieutenant governor candidate who was running against state Senator Burt Jones, who's one of the witnesses in the investigation. And McBurney addressed this, and he, he disqualified Willis from pursuing evid evidence against, but permitted her to continue leading the broader probe. So just him specifically, he carved out and said the rest of it, uh, is is totally fine. And, you know, I, I want to go back to something that you said a minute ago when Judge McBurney uh, went out to the public and clarified after Emily Coors went on her media tour that only deliberations are, are things that, that can't be talked about. But, you know, when witnesses are there or, you know, that stuff can be talked about by members of the grand jury and everything. And I looked very carefully that those five special purpose grand jurors and Emily Coors said were things about when they had those witnesses in the room. For example, how many people had been immunized or how many roughly indictments would you expect there to be more than a dozen? Uh, stuff like that. So, so an example of a deliberation that would not be allowed to be talked about would be to say when the grand jury was meeting by themselves with no witnesses in the room and, you know, without the DA there or whatever and, and being like, all right, so what are the elements of this crime? Uh, what evidence do we have that meets these elements? Does that mean that all three elements of the crime have been met and we should charge this crime to, you know, for this person? Those are the kinds of deliberations that cannot be talked about. And I was unable to find any public mention of anything like that. So um, w somebody reached out to Fonnie Willis uh, and, and her office uh, for comment and a spokesperson declined to comment, uh, but did say, pending our filing with the court in response. So they are going to be filing a response to this. And so that is likely going to take up uh, some time, not, you know, probably not that much time. Uh, so again, I, I don't see Fonnie Willis indicting until this matter is settled. And how long this matter could take really depends on what is appealable to higher courts and how long those appeals uh, could or would take. Something that's breaking uh, right now, Pete, as we're talking, the Fulton County District Attorney's Office has asked to interview Christina Bob. Hmm. Uh, that news just came out. Interesting. And so I, I looked it up, and from a little bit of, of memory, if, you know, as memory serves, and, and was able to confirm this with reporting from CNN and, and the New York Times, Christina Bob was heavily involved with Rudy Giuliani in coordinating the fraudulent electors for meetings and, and certification and things like that. You know, the, remember the fake certificates that were signed and sent 
to the National Archives. Uh, so my question here is why now uh, and why Christina Bob wasn't brought in earlier? But I will say this. It does show that uh, kind of it outlines the fairness of this system, because now the regular grand jury must have been hearing some things and had some questions about certain things. And the, the, the DA now has to bring in Christina Bob to answer those questions. So it's not just a rubber stamp. Like a, like the Republicans were saying, oh, rubber stamp, you can't do this. And I think that that kind of deliberative process, that sort of, you know, we aren't done investigating yet, sort of goes toward helping prevent this motion to quash the entire thing. Because, you know, Fonnie Willis can come back and say, look, this isn't a rubber stamp. This isn't just we're taking what they said and we're just going forward with it. That's the purpose of a special purpose grand jury. This is the purpose of a regular grand jury. And uh, and I think that we might actually see something like that wh when she responds to this this 483 page filing. But I thought that that was interesting news. Christina Bob, they want to bring her in. They ha I guess they hadn't yet. Yeah, I'm surprised they haven't, but maybe not. You know, some of it depends on what you sort of not only the how you want to explain things to the grand jury, but when you get to the point that you have um, potentially witnesses that may or may not be on your side, hostile witnesses. And some of this I was looking as, uh, as you were talking just now too, that I had not remembered that apparently Bob was present for the call between Trump and Raffensperger where he asked him, you know, to find the vote. So this very much could be that, you know, she was a party and very present to these critical events. And part of the reason you bring somebody in the grand jury isn't just to get their information in front of the grand jury. Part of it is if you have a problematic witness to get them on the record under oath. Like, what are you going to say? You know, you're under the oath. You have to tell the truth. Now, you can take the fifth and not answer it. But if you're going to answer, if you do something that is undercut by, you know, 15 other witnesses, you say, oh, yes, Trump said the sky is blue, but 14 witnesses and a tape recording says that Trump said the sky is green. You're locking yourself. If you lie, you're locking yourself into that lie under, you know, the penalty of perjury. So some of this could be not only to get that information in front of the grand jury, some of this may be to lock her into her story. And typically, you know, in many cases, problematic witnesses you tend to bring in at the very end to try and lock them down. So you want the grand jury to understand the facts and maybe the grand jury has heard and from all media accounting has heard potentially from people talking about to say things like that phone call. Then you bring people at the end who may have a different story or a different thing that they're trying to advance. And so if I'm a grand juror and I've heard from Brad Raffensperger, heard a phone call, heard from seven other people in the state of Georgia about this quote unquote Trump's perfect phone call, I've got a pretty good idea exactly what happened. And then if you get a witness like Bob in there who says, oh, no, 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 nothing bad happened. It, it can be very, there are reasons to do something like that at the end. But that's interesting. I'm, I would have thought, you know, maybe they would talk to her. But certainly in terms of when we might expect an indictment out of Georgia, if they're bringing in folks like her, it, it, it's not, it's not going to be tomorrow. You're right. It's not going to be this week, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, Christina Bob's lawyer says she plans on denying their invitation um, to, to show up, uh, basically saying, look, you've had <laughs> a year. I don't, I don't know that the, the criminal justice system works that way, but we'll see. Well, it's not it's, quite it's a subpoena It's a bold think, move. Let's see how, I that, think they're just, <laughs> let's see how that works out. Let's see how it works out for him, Cotton. Uh, it's, not, it's not a subpoena at this point, at least from uh, my understanding from uh, the, the news reporting that I'm seeing right now. It's, it's just an invitation to come speak to the DA, oh, not, not to, to the uh, grand jury. testify before the grand jury. Uh, at least not at this point. So these are early stages then. Uh, and, you know, Fonnie Willis could be like, all right, well, um, uh, we don't Fine, need it. Vote. Or, right. or, or here's your subpoena. Or here's right? a subpoena. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. So we will see. I don't know. It's going to be it's going to be interesting. Uh, <laughs> we are on, uh, of course, imminent indictment watch can mean months now that we now that we know that. Um, but it's looking like the DA in Manhattan is going to go first. And I'm, I'm interested to see those charges too. Um, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what Cohen, like how Cohen is going to rebut this because the, the point that I think Costello from reporting is trying to make is that he did, Cohen told him a long time ago, I'm going to get Trump. I'm mad. I want revenge. His book is called Revenge. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering how this is going to play uh, to 
to the grand jury there and 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 if they're going to vote true bill or no bill meaning are they going to indict him or not and and when that could possibly be i mean it's we're literally waiting at like at we're at any minute point right now yeah i mean look you know the fact of the matter is that one cohen cohen is savvy he's a savvy communicator he has spent the last couple of years in the court of public opinion in front of congress in front of prosecutors making his case for what he did and why and taking you know responsibility for things and you know calling out his own you know bad acts um in in all those different fora so i don't think it, it, cohen is not going to be surprised by anything that costello is going to say i think you know cohen is clearly you know he strikes you as a as a new yorker right when you listen to him you're like yeah i can see this guy being trump's fixer at some point in time so if i am in the grand jury what I've already heard Cohen say, and remember, you know, Cohen's been pretty decent about not talking about what he told the grand jury, but he has said in sort of post grand jury appearances that, you know, all of the grand jurors were engaged. They all asked me questions. They clearly, his testimony was something that resonated with them. And, you know, certainly to the extent that usually, you know, you get grand jury, half of them are asleep a lot of the time. But if all of them are engaged and all of them ask some questions, that tells me that they certainly were a very interested and b found him credible because, you know, they're not going to be that um, curious about what he has to think if they're kind of like, well, I don't know whether or not to trust this guy. So, you know, they've had several sessions of an ability to sort of build a rapport and come up with their opinion. And so for Costello to come in and say, well, you know, as a dirt bag, he was, you know, he's done all these bad things. He's out for revenge. He's not credible. You know, one, I'm not sure that's going to play that well with the grand jury. And certainly if Cohen comes in after that and said, well, of course he's going to say that. Look at this guy. You know, he, you know, bring up the issue of the pardons, bring up all these things that give a reason for Costello to have just talked shit about him for the past few hours. I think, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I between what they've already heard from Cohen, Cohen's personality, Cohen's ability to go up there with the with the prosecutors and sort of clean up whatever damage might have they might have tried to do. I, I think it's gonna it's it's still gonna work in the DA's favor. Well that and like the Manafort case, they have documents. They have documentary evidence that's right. that speaks for itself. And and you know, we, we I've talked to you about this before. We probably brought it up on this show as well. Uh, nobody everybody hated Rick Gates, uh, who was the star witness for you know, for the prosecution at the time. Uh, but the jurors said, well, it didn't really matter uh, because we had all these documents and we had all the evidence. And so it doesn't matter if we hate Rick Gates or like Rick Gates or think he's a credible witness. He's there to corroborate the documents. And that's really all we need from him. It doesn't matter if you hate the person or not, or, you know, or if you're best friends or if you're the biggest scuzzbag the, on the planet like Rick Gates was. Well, second biggest uh, <laughs> when you're talking about comparing him to Manafort. But you know, with the documentary evidence that's that that they must have uh, for for Alvin Bragg to feel confident to go forward with these charges, or at least to bring them before a grand jury, which he is, is is to say he believes he has an airtight case on the documents and that the witnesses are just gravy. Right. And, you know, there's a lot that we don't know, but what we do know of those documents, they support Cohen's side of the story. This is not something where Costello is going to come in and give the jury, the grand jury, grand jurors, a set of information that they're going to say, wait a minute, that lines up exactly with these documents. No, it's the other way around. I mean, of the documents we're aware of, those line up with Cohen's story. So, you know, to your point about it, it doesn't really matter what he says to the extent he's saying something, it corroborates to the documents that they have. So again, I, I, I think it's a you know, pretty poor showing on the on behalf of the Trump side to put Costello in there as their guy. But <laughs> I mean, that's the best Mary, they have. Like right? like yeah. the, the entire, <laughs> the, for, for Trump's, you know, eventual tombstone that, you know, well, it's the best we could come up with, right? I mean, that that's just <laughs> the story of like every goddamn thing is sort of, you know, that way and, and Costello is no different. Yeah, agreed. All right, we're going to be back. We're going to talk with uh, Hugo Lowell about potential Russian money being laundered through the parent company that runs Trump's Truth Social, which he has been freaking out on all morning. So uh, I'm excited to talk to Hugo about what he has found out. We'll be right back with that. Stay with us. Welcome back. Hugo Lowell at The Guardian writes, quote, 
Federal prosecutors in New York involved in the criminal investigation into Donald Trump's social media company last year started examining whether it violated money laundering statutes in connection with the acceptance of $8 million with suspected Russian ties, according to sources familiar with the matter. Joining us on the phone to discuss is political investigations reporter for The Guardian, Hugo Lowell. Hugo, thanks for joining us. This is, you know, just an extraordinary article. And, you know, I think is with all the other news has really flown under the radar. But, you know, it's a federal investigation. It's a federal criminal investigation uh, really going to the core of whether or not uh, Trump's media business and Truth Social are going to be a viable empire. Can you tell us a little bit of the, the background on the story? Yeah, look, so Trump media was already under criminal investigation uh, last year uh, to do with the proposed merger with DWAC, which is the blank uh, check shell company that they wanted to merge with to get a public um, offering. Um, but then towards the end of last year, kind of prosecutors started examining these two loans totaling about $8 million, which were wired to the company through the Caribbean. Uh, and they kind of expanded the investigation because when they had a look at the entities that funded the money, if you trace the money all the way back, it ends up at a relation of a Putin ally hmm. called Alexander Smirnov. And, you know, if, if you look at the way the financing was structured, it you can see why kind of the, the Southern District of New York might have taken a special interest in this. Um, essentially, the, the trustee of the, the, the second entity that loaned the money was a director of the first entity, even though they were uh, you know, ostensibly separate companies. Uh, the, the people involved were all the same. They were doubling up. Um, and the fact that the bank being used to finance the money, Paxson Bank, registered in Dominica, uh, is typically a, uh, a bank that finances kind of the adult entertainment industry. Of course it um, I think raised flags. <laughs> hmm. And what um, sort of information do you have that... First of all, that this money came uh, from Russia and like, what are the receipts there? And second of all, uh, does Trump himself have any knowledge of this? Does he have does he have any oversight of the day to day workings of, of, of Truth Social? We don't know the precise origin of the money. Um, in fact, we really don't know the background to the money other than what's on the wire transfer receipts which we reviewed. And the only information we get from that is that the first 2 million came from an entity called Paxson Bank and the second came from this entity called ES Family Trust. And you know they are effectively very similar, if not one in the same entity. Um, and really it's only through the people who are controlling officers and beneficiaries of the entities do we get back to Russia. But there has been a history of... Um, of kind of Alexander Smirnov and Anton Postonikov, these these the the two people, um, kind of in, in the Russian connection as it is being examined, um, who have who have been basically facilitating money uh, through offshore entities previously, and so I think that's the that's the kind of the Russian connection as to who knew about it. You know, that's really the key question, right? You know, we reviewed an email from Don Junior in December 2021 where he gave his initial approval for Trump media to accept the money. He was copied in um, on a thread from one of the lawyers for Trump media saying, hey, you know, there's no guarantee that these notes are going to be signed, but um, just looping you in that, that this is on the horizon. And he says, you know, thanks, John, much appreciated. Let's, let's go ahead with it. And it basically lies dormant until 2022, in the spring of 2022, when Trump media's auditors start looking at the loans because they need to do it for accounting purposes. And then they raise this question of, well, you know, where did this money come from? You have no idea who the investors are. Uh, and it's, it's at that point that the CFO, Philip Juhan, weighs returning the money, but ultimately, from what we understand, never did. And you know, in the article, one of the, or it sounds like the primary reason they didn't do it is they were in dire financial straits at the end of the year. And had, it looks like about, I think you said $12 million cash on hand and eight of that. So whatever that is, if I can do the math, two thirds of the money, if they had these concerns, they would have essentially been insolvent. Is that the, was that the concern and why they chose to keep it? It sounds like a primary motivator. I mean, we spoke to Will Wilkerson, who was the whistleblower who used to, who was one of the co-founders of Trump Media, 
um, and whistle blew on the kind of the entire operation to the SEC, which prompted the initial investigation, which led to the criminal investigation, which led to the money laundering investigation. Um, but his recollection was at the time, Trump media was really cash strapped because they had intended to merge with the SPAC called DWAC. Um, and the murder never took place because it got delayed pending the SEC investigation. And so they needed these emergency loans to carry them through uh, the end of 2021 and the start of 2022. And then, as you say, in spring 2022, they had about 12 million cash left. And if they had returned the 8 million and then went through a cash burn of roughly one to two million dollars a month, they would not have been in business very long and they would have been completely insolvent before they could even merge with the SPAC and unlock the millions um, that, that they were uh, expecting to get. Now, it says here you spoke to some legal experts. What makes this money laundering versus simply getting foreign financing? Yeah, so from what we understand, um, with respect to these money laundering investigations, they can start based on the fact of or the likelihood that the money in question does not come from legitimate origins. Um, the guy that arranged the financing for Trump Media is actually the CEO of the SPAC that was going to merge with Trump Media. And so he had like a genuine interest in wanting Trump Media to stay solvent so that they could eventually consummate this merger. Uh, and he's an SEC licensed broker dealer. Mm. SEC licensed broker dealers have to comply with uh, know your customer or kind of KYC um, procedures to vet financing. You can't just accept, you know, millions of dollars from obscure entities because we have safeguards in place to make sure that the United States is not laundering potentially illicit or dirty money from places like Russia or elsewhere. And it's not clear that the CEO of DWAC, this guy called Patrick Orlando, actually did that. And it's not clear that anyone at Trump Media did that either. And kind of that's significant because even though the SEC rules about anti-money laundering um, are really for kind of public companies. So DWAC would have been um, responsible for doing that, but maybe not Trump Media. But the money laundering laws are universal, right? It doesn't matter if you're a private company or a public company. If you start accepting money that is potentially illicit, then that would be covered by the statute. And so that's why we understand um, Trump Media became of interest to the Southern District, um, at least with respect to money laundering violations. Got it. What more is known about the uh, whistleblower, Wilkinson? Is he, uh, is he working with prosecutors at SDNY at this point? Uh, yeah. So, you know, the Wilkinson originally whistle blew on the merger arrangements between Trump Media and DWAC because um, SPACs are not supposed to be in discussions where they target company before uh, they are established. And it sounds like Patrick Orlando ran afoul of that because he set up DWAC with the sole intention of merging with Truth, uh, with Truth Social parent company, Trump Media. And then Will Wilkinson's lawyers um, stumbled across the additional payments. And when they did their own kind of digging and they saw these kind of problematic connections, they made their own referral to the Southern District of New York. And they sent the materials to the Southern District of New York. And then we saw the same materials. And, you know, this was in October 2021 when, when they when they sent this tip. And by the time that we had looked at it, um, you know, now, now Mar February, March 2023, um, a lot of the materials had been developed further. And the links from Trump Media and the 8 million back to the nephew of Alexander Smirnov, who now runs uh, Rosmoport. I should say actually that he is a real Putin ally. It's not like we just made up that he's a Putin ally. You know, this guy used to be the first deputy justice minister in Russia. You know, every time that Putin was in office, uh, this guy was also working in the presidential office. Uh, and so there is there is a lot of overlapping links. And even if you know there are ultimately no charges brought in this case, I think the the optics and the fact that Trump's latest business venture. <laughs> since leaving office is accepting money from potentially really shady sources through offshore entities is a terrible look. Yeah. And a question for you. Um, do you have any sense of 
how far along this investigation is, um, you, you know, with with regard to the Southern District of New York? We don't. Um, and, and part of this is because, you know, it is a criminal investigation and it's ongoing and it's multifaceted, right? It, it originally started off with an SEC investigation, then it turned into a criminal investigation into the potential merger. And then now they were looking at, you know, the origins of this $8 million payment. Um, and, and so it's, it's not exactly clear at what stage the investigation is. Uh, we do know that, you know, the Southern District of New York, the team that was looking at this, the assistant U.S. attorney's team, um, you know, some people went back into private practice at the end of the year. Uh, we don't know kind of who was looking at what. Um, but we didn't get the sense that it had necessarily been closed. And so we felt comfortable saying or reporting that it had at least been opened and that at some point last year, late last year, the uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office was investigating. Is there any point in time in the future, more on the sort of like the acquisition side of things, where if the deal isn't consummated between the Trump media folks and DWAC, that it all sort of evaporates and goes away? It's a really interesting question, and there's a lot of competing interests. Um, One would assume that Trump wants this merger to be consummated um, for no other reason than he invested, from what we understand, some money into the blank check company. Mm. Bear in mind, he also owns 90% of the shares in Trump Media. and He didn't put any of the money in. If the merger consummates, he has the ability to effectively cash out twice. He can sell his position in Trump Media, and he can also, in theory, sell his position in the merged company with DWAC, and so he can make twice the amount of money. What's more, he's also got a licensing deal through the Trump organization with Truth Social, which is owned by Trump Media. Uh, And they actually renegotiated that contract, um, I believe in 2021, uh, where he got money for, because, you know, Truth Social was using his image and likeness and, you know, all the Trump branding to promote Truth Social, he made money off of that. So really, in in many ways, it's in his interest for the merger to complete so he can make all this extra money out of it. But from what we understand, because the merger has been so complicated and it's been delayed so many times, there is now interest from Rumble. And Rumble actually, which is a which is a publicly traded company, wants to take over Trump Media. And you know, people close to the business kind of tell us Rumble and Truth Social are effectively one and the same company. Hmm. At this point, you know, they they basically work out of the same office, they have the same engineers, they use the same platform. And, you know, it's only on paper that they're separate entities. And so if, if, if the merger fell through, Rumble would just come in and scoop it up. Um, so there are competing interests here, and it's not clear who would benefit the most. But there are a lot of, um, I think, tangled webs. Yeah. Wow. Super fascinating. And, it, you know, it's also worth mentioning that um, the New York Attorney General has put a, a babysitter in charge of the Trump Organization for any <laughs> Any money that comes in and money that goes out. So uh, it, it'll be interesting to see if that impacts uh, what's going on uh, with the New York Attorney General Office's uh, civil investigation into the Trump Organization as well. Um, but thank you so much uh, for your time today, Hugo. Thank you for going over these details and letting us know what you have. Uh, everybody needs to follow Hugo on social media for all of the latest. And this story can be found in his pinned tweet on Twitter. Political investigations reporter for The Guardian, Hugo Lowell, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, stick around. We've got more news. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, welcome back. What what I think is might be the biggest news of the week, since we don't have an indictment yet, out of Manhattan or Fulton County, is that Guo Wengwei has been indicted. And, And this is going to ring a bell for a lot of Daily Beans listeners and, and Clean Up on Aisle 45 listeners, uh, because he is the guy who owned the boat where Bannon was arrested for his We Build the Wall scheme uh, by Postal Service cops, uh, no, you know, nonetheless. So uh, talk a little bit about, and I, I I, really, I can't wait to talk to you about this, Pete, because I know you know who Kuo Wei is. He's gotten like 900 aliases. There's 700 names, right. 
Right. Yeah. Um, but but talk a little bit about this indictment, because there is over a billion with a B dollars in fraud involved. Yeah, it's a huge deal. And so look, on last Wednesday, on March 15th, uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Damian Williams, along with the assistant director in charge of the New York FBI field office, Mike Gris- Driscoll, announced a 12 count indictment of, and you're right, he has 100 names. The The lead name was Ho Wan Kwok, but also Miles Guo, Guo Wing Gi, Brother Seven, the principal, and essentially was charged with over $1 billion, billion with a B, uh, of a fraud conspiracy. Now, there, it's 12 counts, including various wire fraud, securities fraud, bank fraud, and money laundering charges, uh, which are wrapped up in all of that. According to DOJ's press release last Wednesday, quote, the charges in the indictment arise from an alleged sprawling and complex scheme by the defendants and others to solicit investments in various entities and programs through false statements and representations to hundreds of thousands of Quark's online followers. As alleged, Quark and G, who's his financier, misappropriated hundreds of millions of dollars and fraudulently obtained funds during the course of their conspiracy. But it's not only criminal charges. You know, look, DOJ noted forfeiture provisions, including, and get a load of this, quote, between September 2022 and March 2023, the U.S. government seized approximately $634 million from 21 different bank accounts. The $634 million constitutes proceeds of Quark's alleged fraud, which the government will seek to forfeit. Today, Law enforcement also seized assets that were purchased with proceeds of Quark's alleged fraud, including a Lamborghini Aventador SVJ Rhodes, which I don't, I mean, I know what a Lamborghini is, but I assume the SVG Rhodes is a, a plussed up uh, extra fine automobile. Uh, they go on to detail, this is DOJ, that Guo lived a lavish lifestyle, including what DOJ des- described as, quote, lining his pockets with the money he stole, including buying himself and his close relatives a 50,000 square foot mansion, which we'll talk about in a little bit, a $3.5 million Ferrari, which is different from the Lamborghini, and even two $36,000 mattresses and financing a $37 million luxury yacht. Now, talking about that penthouse during the FBI search. Now it's uh, wait, $35,000 mattresses? 35, who among us? Not one, but two. two is this show brought 000. to us by Helix Mattress? Because that would be great. So, if they- that would be, <laughs> yes. If Helix is, you know, there's more sponsorship opportunities there to, uh, you know, slap <laughs> a little. Because we're definitely not sponsored by Lambo. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's one. What's your sleep number? $36,000 is my sleep number. But it's, I, it's, uh, I, I, I can't, you know, in, in, in all of this... It was in his his luxury penthouse apartment, the Sherry Netherland on the Upper East Side. Guo paid sixty eight million dollars in cash in two thousand fifteen oh. for the entire floor. This cop is the you, it's the whole floor. That there, there is nothing else when you get off the elevator. The entirety is that uh, penthouse. And interestingly enough. After he was arrested on uh, Wednesday morning, at some point just either before or afternoon, uh, a fire broke out, causing the FBI to need to pause their search of that penthouse while the FD, FDNY responded to put it out. I wanted to ask you about that because you've dealt with some spurious mofos in the past. Have you ever been searching someone's place or a business and had like one of those self-destructing uh, safes or like one of those because you know we see it in the movies sometimes right like somebody's got a setup where they can from far away like start a fire to destroy evidence or like what have you ever seen anything like that because I assume this has to be an evidence destruction thing uh, you know I, I I would hope so but I can't guarantee it just agents being agents I mean there's always also I mean so one the short answer is no I've never seen like some timed thermite grenade on top of the safe that's going to melt through all the, you know, the electronics and the cash you have stash, stash there. So I've never, and there was some allegation, like I think one of his assistants put out some aggrieved statement or tweet saying, oh, you know, allegations by some that I set a fire or nonsense. I was not in the area, but I, you know, there is, I, the most worrisome thing would be that it is something that Guo caused to happen to destroy evidence. But there is also, you know, agents being agents. I can see some, you know, dumb probationary agent like, oh, what does this button do? And all of a sudden, you know, or heating up some, you know, pizza that everybody brought in for the search team or some oh, that's stupid it. shit. Yeah. Stupid Toast shit causing evidence. a fire. But anyway, a fire is never anything 
you know, anything good. So I, it's, it's difficult to say, um, what caused it. I, you know, my hope obviously at the end of the day is one that nobody was hurt and it doesn't look like anybody was, but two, that any sort of evidence that would be critical to recover wasn't destroyed as, as part of the fire, but it's certainly an odd twist. I've never, I've never been on a search where a fire broke out necessitating a pause in the search while the fire. Yeah. And I got to ask about this, the building sprinkler system. We know that Trump's failed. Uh, you know, what, what, why didn't that go off? Was that disabled? Like, what is... And by the way, why didn't Guo Wangwei have fire extinguishers uh, around his house to be able to put that? Because, I mean, well, first of all, it's the whole floor. So if you, I can see if you're searching one part of the, of the thing and a fire starts in another part uh, across the building on the same floor that you're not going to know for a while. But it was a three-alarm fire. It was a big fire. So it wasn't uh, something that you know, was was small or, or was quickly put out. Uh, the NYFD had to come out and didn't take care of it. Yeah, and they're truly, I mean, you're right. And so it was a big fire. It wasn't the, you know, kind of thing. And, and 100, 100 things could go on. And this is all speculation at this point. I mean, you know, when a search team comes in now, typically you bring in with the evidence response folks. They'll have, you know, a, a laptop and a printer where they're going to input, you know, as evidence is being seized and catalog, you're inputting that into the system and you can print out receipts to put in an evidence bag. And so there's, you know, when you come in with all this equipment and, you know, cameras to take pictures of the rooms and where you're seizing things and you plug in chargers to charge charge up camera batteries. I mean, there's a lot of electrical stuff, right, that occurs. And so I can I can think of any number of things that might have occurred. But to your point, it's, you know, it, it's one thing that, oh, you know, it's like the, the scene in, uh, you know, Christmas story where they have 18 things all plugged into one sort of block of sockets and it shorts out and starts a fire and you put it out by stomping on it. This is, you know, the fire department came and their photos of from the outside of, you know, smoke billowing from the building. So curious to hear at some point what happened, but, uh, you know, it's interesting. It, 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 nothing straightforward. You don't, you know, nothing, nothing good coming out of a, a fire during a search is something the side profile. And it wasn't, you know, to kind of, you know, close the loop on the, you know, the assistant. Um, there was a uh, Ken Ming J, AKA William Jr., uh, or I'm sorry, William G., who was Guo's finance, or financier, he was also charged with obstruction of justice. Now, according to DOJ, J is a dual citizen of Hong Kong and the United Kingdom who principally resided in the UK. He owned and operated numerous companies and investment vehicles central to the scheme and served as its financial architect and key money launderer. Now, at the time last week, he was uh, not under arrest. I don't think he was in the United States. I don't know if he's subsequently been uh, detained in a, either Hong Kong or the UK, but you know, he was also charged as part of that. And mm. to your point, you know, of interest just beyond uh, what Guo was doing in this fraud, he's you know a significant patron of Steve Bannon. And that, you know, as you pointed out, that Bannon was, it was Lady May, the name of Guo's yacht on the Long Island Sound when he was arrested in August of 2020. And then, you know, of course, Trump, you know, an announcement after midnight in the final hours of office, Trump announced that he had pardoned Bannon. But they still, to this day, Guo and, and Bannon are closely linked. And, you know, there's a recent, and if you're interested in this, there's a New Yorker background article by Evan Osnos. And he notes that the a entity f created by both Guo and Bannon, the new federal state of China, the NFSC, was a prominent supporter of this year's CPAC just you know three weeks ago or whenever that was. Um, so they're still linked. There's there's a close Guo Bannon connection there, and as the press release points out, they name Guo and his uh, financier, but they also say and other individuals. So it isn't just the two of them, and I wouldn't be surprised to see. Um, further indictments or superseding indictments or additional parties being indicted as part of this big scheme. I mean, you can't, a billion dollars, you, you can't, you, that's not something you can pull off with a couple of people. Typically, yeah, you're going to need a, a bigger infrastructure to do that. It, there's no way Bannon's not involved in this. And that's just purely speculation. Uh, although I, I don't see if he, I don't see why he was such close friends with this billion dollar thief, why he needed to raise money uh, for, for <laughs> we build the wall um, and then, and then get caught for that though. He was pardoned for that particular uh, crime. Something you brought up, Pete, uh, that I want to ask you about. Uh, you brought this up on the bonus episode that we recorded uh, for just patrons only this weekend but I wanted to bring it up on the public show. Was it like something like a hundred phones were found 
and many of them were in something called a Faraday bag. Can you talk a little bit uh, about that, what a Faraday bag is? How how often have you run into this type of thing? Did we see them with Manafort's phones or anything like that? No. And so it's interesting because this came up in the context of a forfeiture order. And it's like, you know, if you're you know listening at home and if you're trying to find something, I mean, it's one, you won't get a lot of deep detail typically if you read the DOJ press release. But if you really want to get into the meat of things, Frequently, they will link directly to either the indictment or complaint, or you can go on online and find it, which will have inevitably far more detail than you're going to see in a press release. And also, beyond that indictment or complaint, in this case, there was you know a forfeiture order, you know, sort of laying out all the things that the government had or wanted to seize. And it makes reference to an earlier search, I think it was last year, that there were truly approaching a hundred cell phones, over fifty of which were in what are called Faraday bags, and these are essentially like metal. The, the idea is a, a Faraday cage is something like a metal enclosure where if you place something electronic, whether it is a computer, particularly for you know nowadays, present day cell phones, it blocks any sort of transmission into or from that enclosure. And so many people who are either, you know, if you're worried because you're in some place overseas that has a very aggressive counterintelligence signals intelligence service that is doing a lot of intercept type activity, or if you're some cosplaying wannabe running around the U.S. who's worried about, you know, the Omnicron that Ed Snowden told you is tracking you and everything you do every moment of your life, you can buy these. Little- or if you go to the comedy cellar in New York, I think they take your phone and put it in a <laughs> Right, Faraday well, right, bag. and true. And no. yeah, exactly. In a lot of places, <laughs> they, no, they, but that's true. Like but- <laughs> people are doing that. Like when you go to concerts, they don't want people pirating and recording or videotaping concerts and you won't get these bags. But essentially when you put your, your phone in there, it cuts off any ability to transmit or receive um, information. And it's so it can't important. be tracked. Because, yeah. And, and a lot of it, people say, oh, well, you know, I, I turned off my phone. Well, a lot of phones still, even when turned off, will sort of passively ping cell towers and send signals and they can be manipulated to do other things. So one way you get around it is, you know, sticking it in a, you know, in a Faraday bag and you can buy them and they're, you know, anywhere from 20 to 60 bucks. But nobody, if you are paranoid and have one or two, fine, but to have 50, I mean, that's, I, I don't know what sort of, you know, drug, drug enterprises run with fewer burner phones, let alone burner phones in Faraday bags than 50. I mean, that's an extraordinary amount. And, you know, you can't easily keep, I, I, I don't think Guo would need that many. I, that leads me to believe he was kind of like, you know, had more money than he needed. And I, I, I can't imagine a scenario where he needed that many phones, but it speaks to a level of either understanding and or paranoia about surveillance. Now, whether that is by competitors, whether it's by the U.S. government, whether it's by the Chinese government, whether it's the the voices in his head, I don't know. But it's a crazy amount, and I can't, I, I, I've never seen anything of that volume, so. Don't do meth, because then <laughs> you end up with 50 Faraday bags and 100 burner phones, I guess. Well, my question isn't so much the, you know, the paranoia of the, of the Faraday bags, but what do you need a hundred burner phones for? Like you said, you gr- don't. drug cartels operate on fifteen. Why a hundred? I mean, I guess maybe. I guess I suppose an extra level of paranoia could mean like every single person that is in my contact list gets their own phone or something like that. I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, but that's not. But that goes to the whole point about like you can't a conspiracy this large. You know, if you're going to allegedly mm-hmm. def- have a billion dollar fraud, you can't do that with two people. You know, who keeps track of those fifty hundred phones? I mean, there's going to be some assistant somewhere, some poor schmuck that lists out each phone and the MZ or IMEI if they're super paranoid of each phone and who they use it with. And you know, Guo isn't going to do it. He's going to turn to his guy and say, "Hey, I need the phone that we use to talk to whoever," and the person's going to provide it. So, anything this large you don't do with two people. And and so yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to see more coming. Yeah. And that's a really good point for, you know, a good argument for additional indi- indictments coming down the pike. And, and we'll definitely be keeping our eye on that along with all of these other stories. There's a bunch of stories we did not get to cover today because there was so <laughs> much news this past week, but we're going to follow all of it. And uh, we appreciate everybody listening. And thanks again to our patrons. We appreciate you. You make the show possible. Um, uh, seriously, we couldn't do this without you. It's been a difficult few weeks, as you can imagine, and and so your your patronage really does make make a difference for us in in, in production costs and all that stuff. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and thanks for listening. Uh, Pete, do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here today? No, I don't. I mean, stand by for the bonus episode at the end of the week. I think by the time <laughs> we uh, all talk next week, there's a very real chance that 
for the first time in our nation's history, a former president will have been criminally indicted. So uh, thank you all for cleaning up on Off 45. I'm Pete Strzok. And I'm Allison Gill. We'll talk to you next week. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.